Good afternoon, uh, everyone. And um, Eric, I, I, I'm not sure if I heard you exactly right, and this is very important. Um, I had an undergraduate degree from Carolina. Did you say law? Because I think you did. I don't know. Did you say law? Okay. Because some of you know, in fact, my first question before I accepted this um, opportunity was how many of these guys are lawyers in here? Because I don't know, I started itching and breaking out because <laughs> it seems like I spend so much of my time with lawyers these days. Um, uh, I guess it's just part of the, the business, but um, uh, the Tar Heel part was right, and uh, how about those Tar Heels last night? Yeah. <laughs> Um, and, and thank you uh, for having me, and good afternoon to everybody. Um, you know, when, in preparing for something like this, uh, I usually don't like to have a lot of prepared remarks, so I've kind of written a bunch of notes down on a piece of paper that kind of hopefully jarred me to tell you some stories and a little about me and a little about the history of Family Dollar and a little bit of the, the, the reason why I think we've been successful for uh, now almost 54 years. Um, but I um, also want to leave some time for questions, and I really like the fact that these things start in on time, so kick me if I get going too much or I get too excited about something. I have a tendency to do that every once in a while when I'm talking about Family Dollar, uh, because it has been such a uh, important part of my life, uh, my family's life, and um, uh, frankly, uh, uh, really started in this business at birth, I would tell you, almost at birth. Um, uh, you know, my father started this business back in 1959 and here in Charlotte over in, uh, on Central Avenue, not the current Central Avenue location, but uh, right over in Central Avenue. And um, that wasn't his first business. His first business was he was in the bedspread factory business up in Wingate, North Carolina. And uh, the way he describes it, at least, is uh, his older brother, Sherman, uh, kind of stuck him with that business. Um, his Sherman was having a little trouble with it. And, uh, so my father went in there and, uh, you know, it was a factory and a barn, as he describes it, with two fans on either end. And if any of you guys know about Chenille Bedspreads, they do go back to about 1924 also. Um, uh, after schlepping bags back and forth to New York, he said, this is for the birds, and gave it back to Sherman. Um, uh, and uh, at that time, um, I, you know, was, uh, I was born and uh, my grandmother, um, that to, to, this is my father's mother-in-law, um, basically, uh, she's from Chicago. Sounds like you're from Chicago, too. Rochester. Rochester, okay. Same difference. Same difference. Um, <laughs> uh, said to my father in um, no uncertain terms, you know, you have a youngin' now, and uh, you need to find something to do. Um, so, you know, my father grew up working in his family's business in the retail store, so that's what he knew. Um, he didn't really like working in the store every day, but... Um, knew that that's what he knows, and uh, it's kind of like me. You know what you know, and you're smarter to know what you don't know. Um, so he got started uh, and, and heard about this chain up uh, uh, in Kentucky called the Dollar General. Um, at that time, the, the, the founder, Cal Turner Sr., uh, had started a business uh, that he called the Dollar General, and it was mostly franchise operations. So if you wanted to participate, you'd go there, you'd have a package of merchandise, the first store that he could deliver, and they kind of mixed out the margin a little bit. And my dad, as he described, went up and talked to this guy, and uh, they had a very good conversation, and uh, he was very interested in the business and the business model, and um, uh, came back and was crunching some numbers and said, you know, why do I need to pay that guy his markup and take his stuff? Why don't I just go do it myself? And uh, that's what he did. Um, so initially when Family Dollar started, uh, it was a small store, uh, almost all apparel, uh, just about everything was bought in North and South Carolina at the time from, from the mills that used to be around here. Um, a lot of closeouts, um, uh, and uh, you know, we got off to a start. Uh, you know, what is the most amazing statistic to me about everything with Family Dollar is the company was started with $3,000 he put in, he had a partner who he bought, bought out uh, you know, about four or five years later with $3,000. So $6,000. And there's, there's never been any money other than that money put into the business until about 2000 when, when we decided our stock was down that we went and borrowed some money to buy back some stock, which we've done twice. But other than that, everything has been generated, all the profits, all the growth from internally generated funds. And, uh, it's, it's an amazing statistic to me today, and uh, still is something that you just don't hear very much anymore. Uh, 
but he worked hard at it and got it going and um, uh, you know really um, has shared so many stories with me that there, there's a handful that still stick with me that I, I thought maybe you all might be interested in. One, one of the ones that um, you know I think is, is, is an important one is uh, he says to me all the you, you know you guys don't appreciate the credit that we have at Family Dollar. So well, you know what do you mean? Well we have a credit rating, we used to say compared to General Motors, but that ain't saying much of it. We have a credit rating that's top of the house, so we can go anywhere in the world and buy goods on open account and credit. And, um, that was something that he could do initially. So what he would do when he, he'd go up to New York and make New York trips, spend the four, first four days going to see suppliers, buying goods, and the last day, He'd go and meet what they call factors, which is kind of an unknown term uh, these days too, but a factor was one that um, you had to go talk to to get credit, so you wouldn't have to lay out the cash. One of the things that's most important in our business is we like to sell the goods that we buy from the supplier and pay them with the proceeds of that. So that's what my father did. He'd go and he'd spend the one day talking to creditors, making sure he could get credit, one day get $1,000, he'd pay that bill right on time, then he'd get another $1,500 and so on and so forth. And Today, we're in a great position here because we pay our bills on time, we do everything we're supposed to, and we don't take it for granted, but it is something that I constantly have to remember our team about today, that we can go anywhere and buy goods. That is something that you just can't take for granted. So he goes on and he tells me, you know what I did with my landlords? It's the same thing. Every landlord you go to, and I know there's some real estate folks here, they want a personal guarantee on the lease. <coughs> my father learned early on, you don't want to personally guarantee a lease. Um, and so he, get, he got some chances, people gave some opportunity. What he would do to prove that he would pay his rent before the rent was due. So typically the rent would be due the first of the month. So he'd make sure they get it the 31st or the 30th, a day or two before. So he stuck out in the crowd <coughs> knowing that he paid his bills and so on and so forth. So today, um, that theory's been very important to us. We're up to, uh, I was telling Eric, um, this was report, not it was just through last week. We're up to 7,802 stores. Um, we've, 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 we've reached a pretty significant milestone. Now we do over $10 billion in business. Um, we have 55,000 folks working for us. Um, 11 distribution centers all throughout the country. Our, our most current uh, one is being constructed in Utah today, which will service our stores out west. Um, fully mechanized, about a million square foot apiece. Um, we all, we, we fully paid and own each one of those. Um, so a pretty big operation from uh, a pretty soft beginning, measly beginnings here, right here in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, you know, other stories, there's a lots of stories you used to tell me about negotiations. Um, some of you may have had some experiences with uh, my father in the negotiations. He's very good at it, uh, but he learned a lot. He tells me this story where he went to see a supplier and he, needed some pajamas uh, for the stores and uh, fought hard. They, the guy was asking $48 a dozen. My dad said he was up there for an hour trying to get him down to $36 a dozen. He finally got him down to $36 a dozen. He was excited. He felt good. Then he went next door. The guy um, had those same pajamas that he was closing out. He held him up and said, how would, how would you like these? And the man says, yeah, I'd like those. How much are they? The guy said, $24 a dozen. <laughs> <laughs> That's the worst feeling when you're on our side of the fence. Because you just said, uh-oh, what did I just do? Um, but the lesson there is you got to know your market. You know, to be a good negotiator and not know what you're negotiating for, what you're negotiating, this is really not as helpful as what you might think. So one of the things that he always taught me was know your market, know what you're talking about, know what you want before you even begin to negotiate. Again, a principle that sticks uh, in, in, in my head uh, for a number of years. And there used to be people that would come up to him and say, Leon, you ought to open up bigger stores. You know, our stores are about eight to 10,000 square feet. Uh, uh, we like those small stores. There's a whole set of economic and business issues that we feel comfortable that we know. But somebody said, you know, open up a 25,000 foot store. You, you'll make three times as much money. Well, didn't right, quite work out that way. Um, the store lost a lot of money, ended up closing that store, um, and got back and stuck to our identity. So today, it's funny, I was just in New York last week and people asked, why don't you guys open up 15, 20,000 square foot stores? And I'm in a wide way telling them that that doesn't make any sense for us, but um, we know what we know and we know what we don't know, and we know how to run small stores in communities where there's limited populations and rural markets, 
heavily populated urban markets, inner city markets. We can operate stores anywhere, but we like these size stores, and that's where our niche is. And that's kind of what we say when we, we talk about living off the crumbs of Walmart leaves. And that's a compliment to Walmart in that they're a big box operator today. But if you're like me, or maybe you're not like me, but you probably still don't want to go park in that big parking lot. You got to pick up a handful of items, walk in that big store, and knowing that you're getting good value is good, but even at Family Dollar, you can get the same kind of value. You're not paying a premium for that like you would when you're out of milk and you need to go to the convenience store. Nobody wants to do that because you know you're overpaying, but it's a niche and it's a convenience. Family Dollar offers that same convenience, yet we just don't charge a premium for that. So it's been something that's worked very well for us and something that uh, you know we've been very successful with over time. Um, staying on track here and keeping things moving. Um, just a little about myself. You know, as I said, I grew up in the business. Um, uh, yeah, my dream was to be an NBA player. I used to play a lot of basketball, um, loved playing basketball. Um, for some reason, I stopped growing. My wife says I'm 5'8", five, 5'9", five, I always say I'm 5'10". Uh, and while there's plenty of those small players after broken noses, broken fingers, sprained ankles, this and that, I just decided, um, you know, maybe, uh, now this wasn't until I was about 18 that I made this decision, but, you know, focus on an education, try to learn this business, see if I like this business, and I never turned my back, really. It was something that I always knew I was going to do. I spent a lot of time with my father growing up. In fact, one of the ways I could spend time with my dad was traveling, whether it was on a real estate trip, uh, uh, whether it was out visiting stores, um, traveling with other family dollar management team members. You know, at a very young age, I'm talking seven, eight, nine, ten years old, um, and he always used to kind of, you know, at least maybe we did it at the beach every once in a while. It may have been one o'clock in the morning Friday, but um, we did try to um, have some fun and some personal time at the same time. But I learned a lot through this. I didn't know what I was doing then, um, but it's, it, it must have been like osmosis. It just kind of sunk in and was something that uh, uh, I still treasure today, some of those times that uh, it was just us oftentimes, and if not, it was some other team members that we had with us, and it was a, really a great uh, great way to just get a, a good, solid foundation. Um, you know, then I got older when I was 13, 14 years old, uh, back in the um, early 70s, around 73, 74, we opened up uh, out in Matthews on, on Monroe Road. Uh, I got to be a security officer. Yes, I did cut the grass. That was when we were on Roswell's Ferry Road. Some of you all know Roswell's Ferry Road. I'm just lucky I didn't get shot or anything as I was out there cutting the grass. But um, I did get through that, and then I had to go in there and say, Dad, I'm ready to get paid. And he looked at me and said, I'll get to you later. I said, wait, 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 wait. Give me my five dollars. I, I did my job, and so he finally paid me, and then we go home. And, uh, um, it was uh, just a way to stay productive and make a little money. Um, as I approached my high school years, I was um, began to work in stores. Um, these are as cashier, putting out stock, unloading trucks, unloading rail cars. Um, not something that I really enjoyed doing, but was something that my dad really wanted me to do because. Um, his belief, and I think it was a very good belief, is it's hard to manage what you don't know and what you haven't done. So I've done every job in the company, basically, except run the IT department, and I think maybe I could do that. Um, just wouldn't spend that much money, probably. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, but um, I would, uh, I would uh, work in these stores over the summer, um, uh, usually come home. As I said, I love to play basketball, so I go play basketball. But half the time, after being on my feet all day, my back would start to hurt, and I had to uh, kind of suck it up a little bit. But I was able to play basketball and continue to to work in the stores over the summer. When I graduated um, in in '81, um, I came into the office, uh, started as a fire trainee, and worked my way up to assistant fire and a fire and. Uh, where my real training was, is I, grad I made a little bit of a mistake. I moved into my dad's home soon as I graduated from college. And um, uh, so the deal was, well, he was going to help and coach me when I got home from work, and you know, we'd kind of do a debrief, and he'd, he'd give me some advice. It actually, um, I, I turned, turned the, I, I call it uh, attending the uh, Leon Levine School of Retailing. 
and getting my graduate degree there. And um, let me tell you, that was um, not exactly what I thought it was going to be, but we'd come home, I'd come home, and we'd have dinner, and from about 8 o'clock to about 12 o'clock, we would be talking about business. And I don't know how many months that was, and I said, God, I, I got to get me an apartment. Get out of here. We still in here. Um, but, you know, again, he instilled the beliefs and the knowledge that I just think is so important to be able to do what I'm doing today. And, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, I still do that occasionally today. Um, he's not quite as opinionated uh, as, as he was back then, but um, was able to really pr provide me with such a great foundation. So from 81 to 87, I was at Family Dollar. Then, you know, after working with my dad for all these years, you know, I said, I, I had a bug. And I wanted to do something myself, and um, uh, I, I left Family Dollar and uh, went and started my own ladies' clothing business up in the Northeast in the Philadelphia area. Built it up to about 25 stores, and all through this time, like, when are you coming back? My dad said, when are you coming back? You come up and visit me. Then I heard he sent some real estate people up, and he was going to put a competitive store next to my store and try to put me out of business. And I'm really competitive. And that really ticked me off. <laughs> so uh, he never opened up the store. Um, I talked to the landlord that was down the street, and I said that it, you know they, those guys have trouble paying the bills. At least that store of them. And um, uh, it ended up working okay. But I did finally come back to Family Dollar in '96 um, and um, started as a vice president uh, of, uh, of apparel. And then worked my way up to president. I became CEO in 98. Uh, my dad formally retired in 03 and became chairman then. And, um, you know, since then we've, uh, we've been on a, a great ride. Uh, you know, we've got a, a great company. We've got a lot of good things happening. Uh, and I think um, to get into why I think we're successful, um, if you heard us, we started off, we were a very small store selling only apparel. What I, I like to coin the phrase, we, continue to reinvent ourselves over time. So if we stopped doing what we were doing back in those days, we probably wouldn't be in business. I would even tell you some of the changes we've made in the last 10 years, adding a lot of food, adding coolers, refrigerated goods, a lot more paper goods, home cleaning supplies, laundry. It's been real critical to our success as well. So we don't carry nearly as much apparel as we used to. Um, in fact, it's less than 10% of our business. Where back in the beginning, it was 100% of our business. But we continue to ask ourselves questions. We continue to talk to our consumer to make sure we know what she's asking for. Um, at least every quarter, we get good customer data to understand what's happening to our customer. Um, so I think one of the keys is maintaining relevancy to your customer. And, and in our business, and there's a lot of choices people can go to shop for what we sell today, from the drugstores to the big box retailers to the convenience stores, and we have to constantly challenge ourselves to make sure we're offering the right value of what our customers are asking. It sounds simple, but when you want to make a change and you want to do something, it takes a lot of heart, and it takes a lot of courage, and it takes a lot of research and data and conviction to make some of these changes because, uh, um, you know, oftentimes you have to make some of these changes before you can see the end coming. And, you know, people say, why fix it if it ain't broken? You hear that phrase all the time. And, my answer to that is you want to fix it and do it before it gets broken. Um, you know, when it's broken, it's much harder to fix and much harder to repair. So we always are testing. We're constantly trying to stay in front of the curve. As I say, we're in such a competitive business. I don't know if you guys know, but a good retailer after tax makes five pennies on every dollar. And that, that is tight margins in our business. So yeah, every penny does make a difference. So if we can buy a little bit better, you know, we're global sourcing a tremendous amount of our goods today going directly to the factory, something that we just started recently, um, where we can cut out some of the middlemen. So those pennies, nickels, and dimes can come to our bottom line, continue to allow us to offer great value to our customer. But it, it's been a huge investment for us to build out a global sourcing team. We've got three or four offices overseas now. We're going to have another two or three offices in another couple of years. Um, those offices have to be staffed. Um, oftentimes, they are staffed by Chinese nationals. Uh, getting all those folks incorporated in what Family Dollar's been about took, took some conviction and took some, took some chances for us, but it's paying off and we're starting to get some benefit to help manage our margin a little bit. Uh, one of the things that um, is important in our business is we sell a lot of food, we sell a lot of paper goods, those are lower margins. 
we need to sell apparel, we need to sell home goods, we need to sell housewares to help balance out that mix. So we're constantly tweaking our assortment uh, depending on where the margins are and tweaking our assortments depending upon what the economic situation was. So if you remember back in 2008, uh, the world was about to come to an end. If you were in the retail business, forget it, things were going to be terrible. One of the things that we did, and we've been through periods like this before, we hunkered down. We took some risk out of the business. Number one, we took out some of these discretionary higher risk receipts. So if you don't sell apparel, you know what happens. You're it's like bananas. It goes bad. You have to mark it down and get rid of it. We, we minimized our risk. We bought less of that stuff. We cut our expenses dramatically. We even cut our new store growth. One of the few times in the company's history where we had kind of slowed down new store growth. Now, it was two or three hundred stores, so um, not really a complete shutdown of the business, but really slowed it down. And we got through 2008 better than anybody else. And what I tell people is, we were the number one performer in the S&P 500 that year, not because we had done so great. It was because we just did a lot better than a lot of others at that time. We ran a conservative balance sheet. We didn't have to go to the debt markets. God forbid you had junk. If you had junk bond, you could not go to the market and borrow money. Um, we were not in that position. We had plenty of money, and we were able to get through that. And, and it's funny, when you talk to a lot of the people up in New York, a lot of these research analysts, um, <coughs> that 2008 period was a great time because so many of those people had no idea that things could go wrong. You know, from up to 2008, we were on such a tear in this country, nobody knew what well, you could do no wrong. But periods like this happen, and one of the things that we always keep in mind is, and, and I wouldn't say we're conservative in our approach, but we try to be conservative in the way we manage our business from a financial standpoint. And you never know what'll happen. And when you got all your eggs in one basket, or you've got, you know, you're up to you're up to here with debt, it will limit you and cause you to have issues. So one of the things that uh, you know uh, uh, my dad instilled in me, frankly, was why do you have to even have any debt? Um, you know, when we had no debt up until the two, uh, it was about 2001. Uh, our stock price had dropped, and we went and borrowed some money and bought some stock. We did it a few years ago, and it's been very good investments. But up to that point, we really we never had any debt. Um, the market today doesn't really like that because they want you to use your balance sheet. They want you to lever up a little bit and have a little debt on the balance sheet. Um, and, and some want a little more than what we're comfortable with. Some want a little less. But there is a balance there, so we have borrowed some money. I think for good purposes to buy back some stock, as I say, it's been very accretive to our earnings and something that um, you know, is, is up here and something that we'll always keep in mind. So uh, to some, why I think we've been successful, we, we really focus on our customer. We want to remain relevant to our customer. We manage our inventory. Inventory is by far our largest asset. If we get stuck with bad inventory, old inventory, dated inventory, we don't mark down things when we're supposed to, we have problems. So we're very focused on keeping a good, clean inventory. The third thing is run a tight ship. If you want to be the low-cost provider, and we want, we have to be. We have we're competing. We're, we're, we're competing against the largest company in the world, at Walmart, who can do about anything. We have to maintain our competitiveness with a company like that. It means we have to keep our costs down. Um, so those three things are kind of like inscribed on my forehead, if you can see them. And I know it's a big forehead, but um, uh, things that are very important principles in any kind of business that you run, but when things get tough, some of those kind of things really pay off for us, and it's been a big, important part of, uh, of, of our success. So, so um, I want to make sure I'm, I'm running right here. I know I'm coming to the close here, but you know, I think our best days are still ahead of us at Family Dollar. Uh, we we um, think we can basically double the size of the chain in this country. We're 45 states right now. We've got a lot of infill. And as we keep getting more and more relevant to our customers, we think we continue to have more and more opportunities out there. So um, we're going to open up 500 stores this year. We're on track to do that. I think we can do at least that many next year and so on. So uh, we'll stay focused on our customer. Um, we'll stay focused on our shareholders and make sure we take, take care of our team members. And we think that we're going to be uh, in, in, in great shape. So with that, I don't know if we have any time for questions. I'd be happy to take any. Let's take a question. 